I'd like to share with you a little bit of experiences and a little bit of experiences from outside of Cyprus, from the UK. We've got some UK people who are very familiar with the UK model, but there are lessons that can be learned, also lessons to avoid. And, but there are lessons to be learned from other colleagues internationally. And, and this is what I'd like to share with you. I have actually been to Cyprus before on one occasion, but it's a long time ago. I don't know who's got long memories. There was a University of Surrey program, and I was invited to come along and assess the consulting skills of, um, of colleagues in Cyprus. And I was driven around all around Cyprus with my big Panasonic video with those big boxes in there to video consultations up in the Trodos Mountains, in the outpatients at Pathos Hospital, in the Ministry of Health Polyclinic, all sorts of places. It was all in Greek, so, 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 so but there, you know, it was, it was very instructional about the body language and uh, there's was, was clear communication, but it's also very clear there'd be no training in consult consultation skills. I remember the one up in the Trodos Mountains. We arrived there, I think it was um, about 11 o'clock. And the consultation, and the first patient came in and that was quick, that was only half an hour. The second consultation was an hour and a half. So, so it's wonderful. <laughs> yes, it is. It's very hospitable, it's marvelous. Hospitality is wonderful. Okay, so can I just whiz through some of the, which is the bit I press? Let's have a look, see. Which is the one? Whoops, I'm ending my show before I started. That one there, is it? Okay, that one there, sorry. Okay, so many of you will be familiar with the WHO family, uh, the Alta, Alma Alta Declaration talked about family medicine, George has already alluded to some of this, so I'm not going to bore you with going through it all in detail, it's all uh, history, and it was very important landmark that WHO recognised that family medicine was going to be crucial. The problem was people didn't always buy that, and by buying it, they didn't have the facts, they didn't have the evidence, actually, that it was effective. So it's been very patchy, the progress since, uh, um, since then. Now I'm going to thank my very good friend, Val Was, who is the, uh, a formidable lady doctor. She is the only female dean of uh, UK Medical School. And she, I've also she's worked with her on the international department of the RCGP for many years. And she's the current chair of the, um, of the international committee of the college. And she, so these are some of her ideas. So I've used her presentation with her permission a bit here, just to whiz you through some of the dilemmas, which I think you'll be, you'll recognize. First of all, as George has said, health starts in the, within the community. Yet medical education is all hospital based. Health, as George has also said, is fostered by prevention yet medical education focus on diseases. Another dilemma, dilemma is Greek, isn't it? Is it from Greek? Yes. Health depends upon integration and longitudinal long-term care, yet hospital care is increasingly short stay, highly specialized and focused. It depends upon resources and staff in the community. Yet, for all our students, hospital care remains more attractive, not just in Cyprus, but it's in the UK and it's actually worldwide. And even there in, uh, I don't think that's Sri Lanka, I think that's, I think that's uh, in, uh, I think that's in India, but in one of the clinics there. And the quotes from our medical students have been, uh, you'll be very familiar with, because until recent years, there wasn't integration of uh, family medicine in many of the uh, more traditional uh, GP curricula. And certainly in places overseas, there is very little, until recently. I do always remember, um, and I'm sure, I wonder if this is shared by some of the GPs here, that when you were at medical school, they said, you want to be a GP, just a GP? Sorry, you recognise that, do you? Yeah. 
and it's strange, yet uh, it's so important. And Margaret and I had the privilege of going to the Wonka conference, and George has mentioned Wonka, and so we think, what on earth is Wonka? Wonka is the world organization of GPs, and, um, and actually it's, it, it is a, a really a very vibrant organization. It runs on a shoestring, but it's actually uh, very vibrant, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful networking, and actually Wonka Europe is very strong. And uh, Margaret Chan came to, uh, she's the, obviously the director of WHO, and from a public health background herself, and uh, she uh, came to open the conference in Prague last year. And I was there to hear her say, well, you can read it there, a health system where primary care is a backbone and family doctors are the bedrock, gives the best health outcomes, the lowest cost and the greatest user satisfaction. So that quote is there because there is now evidence for that. So where does the evidence come from? Well, it comes from fantastic researchers like the late Barbara Starfield who died a year ago and uh, from uh, John Hopkins. And she has been one of the main proponents of, of generating the evidence, not just uh, qualitative work, but a lot of quantitative work on, uh, on how important family medicine is. And as George has said, better health levels, better health outcomes, higher life expectancy, higher satisfaction, low, lower overall costs, lower medication use. And so now they're buying it. And hence the uh, WHO uh, updated their paper, and that was their guidance document, primary care now more than ever. And this is important because now there is evidence to back it up. And of course this comes at a time when uh, the paper you see on the right hand side, universal health coverage, is, is, is going so important because many countries have signed up to it and Cyprus has as well. And so this is really important for the people of, uh, of the countries. Now this is something called the Commonwealth Fund. It's got nothing to do with the British Commonwealth. This is an American uh, research institute based in New York and they provide data from a whole variety of sources independently on how some uh, so-called high-achieving health systems uh, are functioning. You can see there, well, you can see for yourself all the dark lines, the dark boxes are ones that score first or second. And the good old UK scores really, really high in lots of areas. In fact, it's the most cost-effective overall. Yet it's one of the worst in terms of healthy lives. So there is, there is a, a, a tension there, isn't there? But in terms of most of the uh, uh, quality of care, most related to access, access for patients and also for efficiency in terms of cost effectiveness and, and the uh, close relationship between uh, generalists and specialists, uh, it, it scores very high. And this isn't just last year's data, every year for the last five years has been like that. So there are lessons to be learned from that, but of course the fact is that's now being squeezed that amount of money each year and there's going to be uh, uh, further reductions um, in terms of per capita amounts for health in the UK. So back to Val's dilemmas. About the role of the community family doctor, well, it's uh, to ex you know, family doctors exclude the presence of serious disease. That's a lot of our work. Whereas our hospital colleagues, they confirm the disease, and that's absolutely right and proper. But as healthcare systems are developing, the care and training is moving more and more of the community, and this must be anticipated and planned for. Now, this is my practice in Surrey. And as you can see, it's just a good square box of a practice, nothing sort of pretentious. We look after 13,500 National Health Service patients. But as George has mentioned, he's got the same stats there that I have. Less than 15% of the interactions we have with our patients uh, result in a referral to a specialist, which contrasts markedly with our other countries. 
most of the referrals are for very short-term opinions and as those who are familiar with the UK waiting list, well, um, that three months is, 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 is quite a good target actually. So they're very short, they're not for long-term care from specialists. And as you can see, it's most health problems are dealt with at primary health care level and less to less than 10% of the costs. In fact, it was running about 8.76, I think, before. And huge public satisfaction. Now, what are the implications for education and training? Well, here's, here's Val, second powerful lady we've had. We've had Margaret Chan, this is Val Watts. She's uh, world renowned in terms of not only education, but also assessment. So I have to watch my P's and Q's with her because she is a very detailed nitpicker. She gave a talk every year at the RCGP. It's a talk called the uh, William Pickles Lecture. Now, William Pickles was one of the first um, researchers in, in medicine in the UK. And he ran it just from his small single-handed practice uh, in Yorkshire, I believe. And there's a memorial lecture every year. It's called the William Wilfred Pickles Lecture. And she starts off with a, with a quote, which is a, a variation of an old Hebrew quote, because she's looking ahead, not just at our current trainees, but our future trainees, because there is a change. Don't confine your students. I think the quote really was, don't confine your children to your own learning, for they were born in another time. And she talks about the generational gap. Those who teach and those who learn, they're looking at it from completely different viewpoints. My daughter's just qualified as a doctor in the UK, and she has impressive strengths that I couldn't cope with at all, particularly with all the work on the internet and everything like that. She's far ahead of the game. I could be a bit canny with just you know, relying upon a bit of uh, experience and dredging up some stuff, but she is well ahead of the game and she's got her thing there, she's got the evidence in front of her before I've even thought through anything. So they have, there is a gap, we have to recognise there is a gap here, so we have to anticipate that they are going to be looking at things very different from what we are. Us old dinosaurs say it's no good looking back to how we were. Okay, there may be lessons we've learned from the the past, we've got to look future. The doctor-patient interaction is going to be different. Now again I've been in the NHS a long time and in the 1980s it was amazing. We had this sea change, this paradigm shift they call it, from traditional doctor-centered uh, medical model of consulting to a patient-centered model. And there are all these luminaries like uh, David Pendleton and, and, uh, and Peter Tate and people like that who drove the MRCGP exam and pushed us all into this. In fact, it was a revelation. And so we all moved to patient-centered consulting. But actually, there has to be flexibility and it can't just be one thing or another. Because Val tells us, look, actually, um, all the stuff that Michael Ballant told us about the doctor as the drug is really important. And the doctor knowing themselves to be able to have a therapeutic relationship with their patients is vital. And so the idea of just being doctor-centered or patient-centered doesn't really exist. It's, and the patient will have very different expectations depending upon their own generation. <coughs> Globally, global health is really important. I'm fortunate that I chair the uh, International Forum of all the medical and nursing royal colleges, their international departments, and we've put a big initiative through to introduce global health into uh, royal college structured training curricula. Because even in the wilds of Surrey, I've got big cohorts of patients from Mauritius, I have uh, travellers who are, you know, Romani origin, all sorts of different languages, and that's in Surrey, which really is a bastion of, of sort of uh, you know, Anglo-Saxon, and it's really important. And 
many other places if you're in Tooting it will be quite different so St George is there there's this global awareness that really has to be built in because our patients will be bringing us all sorts of fascinating cultural uh, uh, views and perspectives on things so the young doctors of the future reliance flexibility resilience they've got to be resilient because I don't know what it's like in Cyprus, but in the UK at the moment, there's a drip, drip, drip of negative feedback and attrition from the press, the media, all sorts. And poor old surgeons are being, uh, they're going to be advertised all their failures, well, not failures, all the patients who succumbed during their care, as if that was a measure of how good they were. So they've got to be resilient. They're going to need flexibility, they're going to be assertive, and they've got to have negotiating skills because they are going to have to be the leaders and the change makers. And we have to embrace collaborative working with our, between generalists and specialists and between the different professions. And this is the name of the game, certainly in the UK and in So tomorrow's doctors, many of you will be familiar uh, with that. This is the GMC uh, directing how medical schools should reorientate their curricula and learning outcomes. And as George has already mentioned, in the UK, the aim for health education in England, there's 50% of young doctors coming out of the generalists, 50% of the specialists. And yet, but it's heading up. And it's going to be more community based. So, we've got some examples internationally of, of family medicine training and, and uh, got very, very solid Northern European uh, democratic uh, health systems, uh, such as in Denmark. And I had the privilege of working with colleagues in Denmark. And they increased their training curriculum from just a, it was, it was just a six months actually in, in family practice at one time now, to five year training program. And this is because there is this culture of, of democracy and it's a bottom up approach. But they've moved to uh, a five-year training program just because there's so much that's going to be required of the generalists. But they've put an emphasis on training. They've invested in trainers and training practices. And this has been really quite important in terms of being able to do this because it's no good increasing to five years if you haven't got the capacity there and the trainers there. And this has had outcomes in terms of the profile, the prestige, the recruitment. Now, in fact, the GP training programs are have the highest number of applicants, much more than any of the specialties. And it's increased the skills of the educators. If we contrast that with a country which is certainly not a democratic country, that is Kuwait, um, who are a very uh, oil rich and wealthy country, and they have moved in, in my time, which I've been working with them since 90s, early 90s, uh, from uh, again really a hospital based program to a five year uh, training program for the QAT nationals at the moment. The vast majority of doctors there, of course, are not nationals, they're expats who are, who are working in SGPs, but now they're turning their attention to them. But to be able to make the change that was necessary to raise the profile, to raise the interest and enthusiasm of family medicine, they had to set the bar high. And so they were one of the first sites that was accredited for the MRC GP International because they needed to demonstrate they had something credible because they had some very eminent uh, hospital specialists there and they were very skeptical. And so they had to set the bar high. And uh, they have a most vibrant uh, lady, Dr. Samir Musalan, who's in charge of the Family Medicine Training Program. And again, it is now the most popular specialty training program uh, in Kuwait. So they've used assessment to drive the learning and the teaching. So, different approach from, from Denmark. Um, now they are turning their attention to those neglected uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, the expat doctors who are running a lot of the general practices there and so they hope to give them some of the advantages um, that the um, uh, national can enjoy. That's Jane, that's uh, George's slides, I won't spend any time on that. So how do we make it happen? 
how to make what happen? Well, first of all, WHO said this. If you're going to uh, increase the capacity and capability of your human resources for health, and remember there's a, a, a massive uh, deficit of, of, of uh, healthcare workers um, worldwide, it's got to be this uh, productive partnership between those main stakeholders. It can't be uh, competition, it's got to be collaborative working. And, uh, and uh, they've got to be wanting to work together because if they don't, it's not going to, um, it's not going to uh, progress. So the uh, lead may be taken by, well, it may be taken by uh, ministers. And when I was um, uh, working, I don't know whether you came to David Hassan's lecture, did you, any of you recently? Well, um, when David was president of the college, we, were, we got a summons, he and I, one day to the Egyptian embassy in London. And the Egyptian ambassador was there. He said, look, I've called you because you've been doing an external assessment on our family medicine exam in Egypt for the last 10 years. And I gather you've been sending reports back saying it's rubbish. I said, not well, exactly rubbish, but it's got a significant area to improve it, so residency. <laughs> and he said, yeah, okay. Um, but I'm introducing a new health insurance scheme and I've got to have family doctors to deliver it and I need them high quality and credible. And so um, he said, um, what would you do? I said, well, first of all, we'd make sure the actually curriculum was reviewed and actually reflected family practice in, in Egypt. Do you know what that actually is? And um, it would be very helpful if uh, family doctors were involved in the devising of that curriculum. Very helpful if they're involved in the development of a competence assessment. And it also be very helpful if they actually examined it and set the standards. He said, Well, a bit novel, isn't it? Can I have a few of my academics in there? Oh, yes, of course. Yes, yes. But the message was that he said, I want that now. How quickly do you think you can deliver this? Help us deliver it. And he said, Well, with a fair win, perhaps five years. He said, no, I want it in a year. Well, it can be done. And if the policy makers and the government want it to be done, it can be done through a lot of resources and all the time of the brightest and best young doctors. And he, uh, brightest and best young doctors. And he, um, he also uh, invested a lot of money in, in some Suspended tutors, uh, it included Peter McCrory, um, to actually help them set up their assessments. And they did not in 12 months, but in 14 months, at a world class exam. Problem was, the training has a long way to catch up. It has a massive failure rate because the training facilities are terrible and the teachers haven't been supported in developing themselves as educators. The trainees are marvelous, they're just as good as any other trainees anywhere else. Unless you have the right learning environment and the right sort of teaching support, then it's very difficult. So this uh, 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 joined up thinking has got to be the case. I'm not sure how that exists at the moment in Cyprus. And in growing your own, uh, it's got to have the infrastructure there. And I don't know how many uh, training practices there are, how many training practices there are like in Cyprus. I maybe suspect they haven't changed an awful lot since I was here last time. <laughs> but it does need proper programs that are designed to actually deliver the outcomes. But also, you do need external evaluation because you're working in a vacuum otherwise. And it's really, really important to have external evaluation. And I'll just come on to that. So growing your own, you need to attract students. And we're saying that they may be much more attracted to some of the hospital specialties. We don't really know how family medicine is. And this isn't just medical students, this is our GP trainees as well. So first of all, we've got to recruit them. And you've got to recruit ones who actually show an interest. They may not know a great deal about it, but they show an interest. Working in the community, but they've got to have exposure, and that's so vital. 
and having role models of family doctors they can work with is again a vital component of this because working with a role model is, is very important. We all know about apprenticeship models of working and we all remember our, our most uh, uh, poignant and most uh, useful role models in the teachers that we've had over the years. We can learn with the bad ones as well. So the, there's got to be community family medicine training at undergraduate and postgraduate level and uh, also of course provision for uh, continuing professional development for experienced doctors. It's got to be competitive salaries. This is really important because in, at the end of the day we've, we're all been through a tough time in the session and it needs competitive salaries. Uh, salaries that can be seen to be on par with our um, specialist colleagues. And it's got to be supportive of leadership and education. So here we are, this is just my surgeon, my own consulting room with one of my um, um, trainees there, seeing a patient who just so then map, mapping a consultation, but the next patient in, he maps my consultations. So it's, it's important. The first time I've been to the University of Nicosia Medical School, and this is really impressive. I don't know, have you all been in the library in the anatomy labs there? They're state of the art stuff. But the important thing about the University of Nicosia medical program is that it's got external accreditation, delivering the St. George's program and having the GMC accreditation is just the most important thing imaginable. Because uh, without that, uh, it's not for me to say Examining success of the uh, student numbers are shown at the moment. So, how can this be taken forward to uh, postgraduate education and training? Well, at the moment, again, an initiative is being uh, uh, shown by people like George and people who have to back him, um, like yourselves, coming along tonight, but also uh, uh, the executive dean of the uh, of, of the uh, university. So the uh, external accreditation is important, particularly when you actually haven't got a program that's actually started. This is why training needs analysis are so important and having them externally commissioned is really, really important catalyst for getting anything going. And so the RCGP came, as George has mentioned, and provided a very helpful report because uh, the ideas of actually having an MSc program for uh, Cypriot doctors and those in the Eastern Mediterranean is great. But actually, it would be even better if there was a diploma level that was clinically focused, which enabled doctors to be able to demonstrate their quality and, and, and have that accredited the MRC GP and, and uh, standard, which uh, uh, they've recommended and so this is what's going to be pursued. That doesn't mean to say that people enrolling on this don't progress through their masters and, and undertake a research um, proposal and research dissertation because that would be hugely encouraged because research, both qualitative and quantitative in family medicine, is in short supply, hence the time it's taken to be able to get the um, Alma Arta agreement going. Here's some words from another powerful lady. I don't know whether any of you have met or heard of Professor Janet Grant. She is one of the gurus of, of, of um, education and training and um, worldwide and uh, an expert on curriculum. And this is just some extracts from her article in the BMJ about why it's vital that you always have an external training needs analysis undertaken. And um, it should be the starting point for designing formalised education systems for professional improvement. The example of the RCGP TNA report I've just mentioned, that actually they came up with a very good idea, saying that this MSc programme is as good as other NMSCs proposed elsewhere, but why don't you actually make it relevant to actually uh, practising physicians and so that they can demonstrate their quality? So this is what it's going to be actually, starting from this autumn. It's going to be a young one-year clinically focused program for working for community-based doctors. Eight modules, 
focusing on consultation skills, focusing on the various systems, acute, chronic conditions, but also heavily on evidence-based practice. And it's wonderful that David Hassan, the chair of NICE, is, 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 is working with and teaching on that. There's going to be a theme running through the whole of this, what it's actually like being a family doctor in the Eastern Mediterranean and the uh, contextual and cultural and ethical issues that, that, uh, that come up. And there's going to need to be a fit for purpose assessment, so as we've said, uh, it's got to be credible. So to, how do you make it credible? Well, many of you who've been involved in education will be familiar with uh, Miller's Pyramid, Miller's Prism as it's sometimes called, which helps uh, educationists design assessments that are going to be fit for purpose. And there you've got to have within them components of, uh, for a competency assessment, people have got to demonstrate that they know um, how to do things. So a huge applied knowledge tests and the current methodology is mainly single best answer MCP format. There's got to be a huge um, uh, clinical and consulting skills because they've got to be able to show how they do things using mainly simulated uh, patients. But also increasingly in, in assessment circles, it's so important to introduce workplace-based assessments because it's the only area where you can really show how they are performing in practice. So most assessments, certainly for the MRC GP, and heavily uh, weight on the applied knowledge and clinical skills, but increasingly on workplace-based assessments. And this diploma program will have that. Whoops, that one slide has not come out. Sorry about that, we'll skip it. I seem to have got stuck. Oh dear. How can I move it on? George? Oh no, here we are. That's it. What's happening here? It's coming through in fits and starts. I do beg your pardon, that's what it is. There we are. It should all come up at once. This is what a training to be a GP in the UK. How we make them train. These are all the people they've got to communicate with, and many of you who have been GPs in the UK will recognise some of these. And we've got lots of people breathing down our necks in the NHS, the clinical commissioning groups. We've got care quality commissions. If we're in training practices, we've got health education in England uh, breathing down our necks. We've got all these people, some of which we employ and some of which we don't, to communicate with. We have to have this rapport with our consultants and at the same time uh, deal with our, uh, our, our resident detriment, which is our residents of patients. So, Fit for purpose assessments. Now, the UK have been through a bit of a, uh, a sea change themselves, and it wasn't so long ago when the GMC said to all the medical royal colleges, uh, actually, you've got to get your act together. Because if you don't, we'll do it for you. You've got to review your curricula, and you've got to have uh, specialty assessments that are fit for purpose. And here are the design methods you should use. So the stuff we've just been talking about has been applied in practice by all the Royal Colleges in their own way to make sure they can assess their own particular specialities. And as we're probably all aware, the ideal curriculum is you have your learning outcomes, have the course of study and teaching and learning, and you have the assessments. They're all beautifully joined up, but as we all know, the real reality of life is actually there may be some jolly good examples of that, but there may be uh, some learning outcomes which actually don't have any teaching or hardly anything to them at all or they may not be assessed or actually you're assessing things you weren't even taught. So that's all familiar stuff. The RCGP curriculum actually has been, is, has been helpful, even though it's just designed for UK GPs working in NHS, it's helpful as a template for others to have a look at to make sure they're not missing out elements and to just be able to orientate themselves to what actually does a family doctor do and at what sort of level. So that's all available online and it is helpful because their MRCGP in the UK is, uh, has been seen on uh, uh, by the GMC to be fit for purpose. Cease van der Vleuten was, is very important because when you're looking at assessments you would say look for a high stakes like a, 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 a summative assessment. You need actually to have assessments that are valid, they reflect the day-to-day -day work, they are reliable, and reliability needs to increase the more important it is whether these careers are going to depend on this, what the educational impact is, how um, 
uh, acceptable this is to the uh, to everyone and how feasible and realistic that means cost effective and so his very important is sees van der Freuden. he'd say look you need a blueprint of your curriculum and by a blueprint this is what the um, uh, Cyprus family medicine curriculum will look like oh great big grid what does that mean well actually as you can see that it's quite straightforward these are all your clinical areas here and within those there'll be subsets and for instance in cardiovascular hypertension and heart failure and arrhythmias and so on and so forth and these are the various modules that are going to be taught in addition to that there is this the uh, competences required of a family doctor in terms of diagnosis investigation and management and the point of a blueprint is you can actually purposely commission your questions to actually populate that so you're covering the whole of the curriculum in either your applied knowledge tests, your clinical skills assessment or your workplace based assessments. So it's quite complex but it makes sense. So that's a, a big challenge ahead George. Um, just for those who don't know what the MRCGP int is, it's, it was born out of a questionnaire we sent around to all the colleagues we've worked with internationally. We said, how can we help you best? They said, look, we need to be credible. We need to have, to be able to look our colleagues in the Ministry of Health, our hospital specialists and our public in the eye and say, actually, we are a discipline in ourselves that is just as important, generalism is just as important as the specialties. And family medicine has its own particular characteristics. And as we've seen for well-developed countries like Denmark, you know, they, they don't need us. But countries that actually have a long way to go, they do. And uh, so it's all about developing the local capacity involving the local people to uh, train them up to be able to develop their own um, uh, curricula, their own assessments, which then can be accredited as seen by many would say that MRCGP is a, is a gold standard for uh, assessments worldwide. And it's the same academic rigour, not the same clinical standard because that's going to vary from country to country and context and health systems, but um, in terms of the academic rigour it's going to be the same. Okay, these are the countries that, have, uh, that are all accredited sites so far and as you can see it can sometimes be something that bridges uh, barriers. South Asia was particularly interesting because uh, we were requested, we've been working with the individual countries, uh, some have a few very small examples of structured training, some have, most have nothing for a quarter of the world's population and um, they can't work together politically but academically they can. So we've got a, uh, an academic board from uh, all of those countries who are working together very well, providing an assessment for doctors who actually have no other opportunity to demonstrate their quality. And I've talked about Malta, uh, Egypt, and it's quite interesting, Malta. Malta don't actually need, it's like Cyprus. They don't really need the MRCGP because they're members of the European Union, but they say they do for the, some of the reasons I've mentioned. And uh, next year it's intended the Kosovo will be accredited and that's pretty amazing considering it's a post-conflict country and, uh, and the exam is going to be in Albanian. But it could be a catalyst for raising the profile and throughout the uh, Albanian-speaking Balkan area. Big thing as I'm sure uh, Bert will recognise, one thing we never do is bungle in the Balkans because uh, it's you wouldn't have a clue of understanding anything about that, but we can help them academically develop their own. And they're doing very well indeed, despite inherent, this is going online, so I won't say it, but it's uh, difficulties politically within their country. And we hope, with a very fair wind, uh, that Cyprus will also have accreditation of MRCGP in, in October next year. But the College of GP has said, that is a very tall order. But if Egypt can do it, so can Cyprus. So you have a specialty training scheme, George has mentioned it, it's embryonic quite frankly, isn't it? Two men and his dog, you know, it's not, it's not much. So there needs to be a huge upscaling of capacity in that. But they need a training needs assessment. And uh, speaking with colleagues at the Ministry of Health this morning, 
they seem quite receptive to that idea because that's the first stage as a catalyst for moving things on. Okay. In order to be thinking ahead of the game, Val said, look, think ahead. Interprofessional training primary health care professionals. It's best conducted in well-organized generalist training practices. And it's not just for medical students and doctors. It's for nurses, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, physician assistants, paramedics, paramedic practitioners. Because paramedic practitioners in the UK, 90% of their work isn't scraping people off the road. It's actually dealing with acute exacerbations of usually chronic diseases. Thank you, George. So I've taken so long.